This week, we welcome Jen Ellis, Vice President of Community and Public Affairs at Rapid7, to discuss strategies and policies that will truly disrupt cybercrime. In the Leadership and Communications section, CISO versus CEO, how executives rate their security posture, three reasons why cybersecurity is not a technical problem, how to be a great listener in remote meetings, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Week. With over half of enterprise security budgets going towards detection and response in 2020, the challenge is investing in solutions that can migrate and scale with your business. ExtraHop helps security teams spot threats up to 95% faster and respond 60% more efficiently in hybrid and multi-cloud environments with cloud-native network detection and response. Kick the tires in the full product demo at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 175, recorded June 1st, 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado. Joining me from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island is my co-host, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Hey, Morning, Matt. Paul. Morning. It's good to be here. Yeah, we have a pre-record this morning, a nice early uh, uh, session. Early with for us. you, yeah. Yeah, it is. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Join us at InfoSec World 2020, June 22nd to 24th. Now a fully virtual event. Security Weekly listeners say 15% off the InfoSec World main conference or World Pass. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2020. Click the register button to register with our discount code. Also, join the Security Weekly mailing list and receive your invite to our community Discord server by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Click the button to join the list. We are live streaming a number of our shows now and interacting with people on the Discord server. So uh, it makes it a lot more interactive during the show. All right. The reason we are so early this morning, pre-record, is Jen Ellis is joining us. She is Rapid Seven's Vice President of Community and Public Affairs. She believes security practitioners are the guardians of society's trust in technology and works extensively with security professionals, technology providers and operators, and various government entities to promote better collaboration. She believes this is our best path to reducing cybercrime and protecting consumers and business. To this end, Jen has also provided free skills training to security professionals so that they can get greater buy-in and achieve more security outcomes. She has testified before Congress and speaks at numerous security events when they come back in their physical format. (laughs) Jen, (laughs) welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thank you for having me, and thank you for accommodating the time difference. I really, really appreciate it. My yeah, you know, have... when we, yeah, whenever we have a guest come in from uh, Europe, and you're in the UK, uh, it's usually a little better to do it earlier in the morning, so it's not so late for you. So, yes, we'll make. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, it does mean I'm not disrupting dinner, dinner for my family, who I'm currently squatting with. I am, <laughs> I am the uh, the auntie in their attic, which is in awkward position to be in um but you know this is what we do during a pandemic all right i have a matt i have an opening question for uh for jen uh it's a serious one as well uh no joking no 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 serious questions (laughs) there will be no serious questions well you know as i was thinking about the this interview and your unique position in information security there are many uh firms primarily in the u.s that 
some believe the government should assist them in defending against nation state attacks. You know, I'm sure you've heard this before, Jen, right? They Mm -hmm. believe, well, if we have to defend ourselves against other nation states, why isn't the U.S. government helping? Where does the responsibilities fall between government and uh, enterprises? Yeah, it's a really difficult question. Um, And it it is one that comes up often. You are correct, Um, particularly when you have um, either... A, a large target that is uh, a, a, a persistent target um, and is drawing fire from very sophisticated attackers, or you have uh, the ones I feel most sorry for when you have um, a startup who's developed something really cool, unique, and interesting, mm-hmm. um, and that makes them a target um, for corporate espionage. Um, and particularly for countries where they might. So as an example, um, I talked once with a company who had developed some new cool biofuel thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very different to what anyone else was doing, but they, they were still a startup. So they had startup resources, but they had something that, you know, could potentially make them a target of, of espionage from some pretty heavy hitters with a great deal more resources than they had to defend against them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in those situations, it is understandable for organizations to look to the government. Um, the reality is, though, like today, there is nothing, um, there's no sort of legal requirement for the government to assist. And there's a real challenge in what the government can assist with um, before, one, it becomes, you know, potential overreach, or two, um, it runs the government's resources dry because the government also has mm-hmm. very limited resources. And I think the question becomes, where do you draw that box? You know, how do you, how do, you do it? And so I think what governments generally do is they approach this in two different ways. So one is they look at what are the things that they can do that creates a rising tide that raises ships and helps, potentially helps all organizations. And that's where you see governments um, get really involved in, in, in cyber information sharing and start to become big proponents of information sharing. So for example, when um, uh, DHS to say, hey, we should have ISACs mm-hmm. um, to enable industries to share information. Um, sorry, did you want me to clarify what an ISAC is? I... No, no, no. No, we know. Okay. Everybody should know. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, I just, I don't, I hate being too jargony, so I try not to be. Um, because I spend a lot of time talking to people who have their own different jargon mm-hmm. of a, a very different expertise area. And, and so um, I try not to like feed the jargon monster. Um, but yeah, so that's one way that they try and do it is, is to think about what are things that they can do that basically create a greater good um, that impacts everybody and benefits everybody like information sharing. Um, and then the second area that they look at, and it depends, it, it varies country by country, is they look at what are the sectors that they should prioritize to get more hands-on with. Mm-hmm. And um, and so what you see is generally critical infrastructure gets gets raised to the top of that. Now, how people define critical infrastructure varies country by country as well. But with critical infrastructure, you know, when they put it into that category of like high criticality, so when you're thinking about people like um, power providers, water providers, that kind of stuff, they get more assistance, much more hands-on assistance. And there are um, different sorts of sets of rules on how governments engage with them. And as an example for that, um, every government that I engage with is currently super focused on giving air cover to the healthcare sector in their country mm-hmm. at the moment, you know, and and has been since this situation arose, um, because you know healthcare is is our number one um, resource mm-hmm. right now. Um, you think that's a direct uh, response to WannaCry uh, in the UK's national healthcare being down? Um, I think I think that WannaCry paved the way. Mm-hmm. However, you know WannaCry was in twenty seventeen. And uh, or 2016. I think it was 17. Mm. Yeah, 17. And and uh, yeah, sorry, it was it was like a month before not Petra or something. But yeah, so yeah. one across 2017, and here we are in 2020. And so you know, three years went by, mm-hmm. and so it's not like you know, I, I actually was on a um, uh, a a virtual conference recently, and it was on healthcare. Um, and uh, you know, somebody said, well, this has now made it so that people understand that cybersecurity is an issue of patient safety. Right. And I was like, yes, I hope that's right. 
but we said the same thing after WannaCry, mm -hmm. after, you know, 80 hospitals closed in the UK. Yeah. Um, we said the same thing. This is now clear. Cybersecurity is a matter of patient safety. And three years later, we still weren't super prepared mm -hmm. for how to really help the healthcare sector. And that's not because nobody's working on it and everybody forgot. It's because it's a horrendously complex question mm -hmm. and resources are really stretched and, and really limited on every side of the equation. You know, nobody is sitting there just going, Oh, I've got, I've got this entire army of security people behind right, me, but right. they're mine and I'm not letting anyone use them. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough. What I think we've seen though, out of the current situation that is different is we've seen an, an enormous volunteer effort emerge. Mm -hmm. And that volunteer effort has partnered with governments to then help and assist the healthcare sector. And we've seen that through efforts like the CTI League, the Cyber Threat Coalition. And I mean, like those efforts have thousands of members. So, you know, I think that's different. And I think that's a really cool thing. Now, that's also sometimes in direct conflict with various government agencies who may come across, discover and or develop zero day exploits for vulnerabilities and it's kind of an interesting debate whether they're not yeah. they're going to tell the vendor that there right. is a zero day or not yeah. where where do we fall today i know there was some legislation but it still has some loose language like yeah you should tell the vendor yeah. except like if you really want to keep it for yourself then it's cool <laughs> <laughs> So there are definitely rules. There are what's called a vulnerability equities process. Um, the US has one, the UK has one, a number of other governments have them that have been published. Um, and you can go and look them up and see what they say. And what they do is they acknowledge that there is that tension, exactly mm -hmm. as you say, because most governments have a vulnerability handling or a vulnerability coordination authority of some description. So um, CERT coordination center and or, or uh, the NKIC uh, um, um, DHS uh, in the US and, and in the UK, um, uh, uh, UK CERT and, and NCSC um, and and other governments um, have their own. There's a the, there is a CERT in every country basically, mm -hmm. um, and so there is a tension between that part of the government that is trying to coordinate um, the the way that vulnerabilities are disclosed to create the least harm and the greatest Im positive impact with society. And then there are the offense capabilities who, as you say, may be discovering um, vulnerabilities on their own and, and sort of uh, thinking, oh, well, look at how we could use these. Um, I think after Eternal Blue mm -hmm. came out and the, and the um, disclosures around that, there was a very, um, there was a strong reaction and, and, and a very clear call for the vulnerabilities expertise process to become much clearer and cleaner and and more transparent um and so now there is um there's supposed to be a uh, a much more effective separation uh i like how you say it's supposed to be <laughs> I, I mean like who knows right like okay. i i operate in good faith i think hope for the best prepare for the worst is always a good thing mm -hmm. um i i think that i can tell you this we work closely with a number of certs including working closely with CISA, which is the part of DHS that deals with cybersecurity. Um, and uh, and we will disclose vulnerabilities through them um, perfectly happily. And we do not think that they're like leafing through them and deciding which ones to send to the NSA, right? We, that's, that's just not a thing that we think is happening. Um, and so I think you have to operate on good faith with this um, and realize that it's actually not in their best interest. And, and like, frankly, if Eternal Blue proved anything, it proved that like people get caught with their fingers in the cookie jar and it doesn't look good for them. Mm -hmm. and it, it hurts them in the long run in terms of the kinds of oversight that gets placed on them. So I think like you have to operate in some level of good faith based on on what you see them doing and, and we've seen them be super helpful in the way that they've coordinated and managed uh, vulnerability disclosures and and pushed for both better uh collaboration between vendors and researchers and and how they've supported researcher rights and that kind of stuff i think with vulnerabilities equities 
there is always going to be a certain level. Like, yes, you can have it published and be transparent and say, like, these are the rules, but there's going to be a certain level of um, opacity around how they think about which are the ones that they're definitely going to consider to be secret. What I can tell you, though, is that there is now a lot of oversight in place. So mm -hmm. if they decide to keep a vulnerability secret, they're not allowed to just be like, we found this thing, don't tell anybody. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. like, they have to get permission to not share it. Yeah, and, and they what have I to hope go is, through, you know, the that, that yeah. balance of power really takes yeah. place in that if we do need to keep a, you know, air quote cyber weapon secret, right, that yeah. we're using it to protect people on this earth, yeah. right, that that benefit far outweighs the notion that we should go tell the vendor and have people, well, some people patch it and some people not and then have bad things right. happen, right? When I look right, at right. Stuxnet as an example, I mean, I, I think people kind of lose sight of, like, Iran wanted to drop nuclear bombs on all of its enemies. And the U.S. was on that right. list, right? So right. you kind of put some trust that that balance right. of power is going to make the right decision. And, like, here's the thing is, um, there are some governments that are very sophisticated in their cyber capabilities and very active in their in in their cyber campaigns mm -hmm. and so you cannot minimize or diminish how much of a threat that actually is you know right. and it's funny because like i feel like often when i get into conversations with people um around the fact that like you know cyber security is actually relevant to people in their lives mm -hmm. I, you know people who don't work in this every day all day tend to be a little bit like is it and i'm always like no no really it, no, no, it kind of really. is because like you know the lights could go off and they're like well why haven't they and i think the answer to that question is honestly because the government actually does do quite a lot of stuff behind closed doors i completely agree also, right like that yeah, right, super top and, secret is there a day exploit was <laughs> what allowed us to plant a mole in monitor GRU that when they were about to turn the power off in the US, we were like, eh, 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 no, 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 you right, can't Right, that, right, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, your power's going off instead. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I, I think it is important to understand there's a reason that the vulnerabilities equities process exists. Now that said, I think when you look at a situation like COVID, I, th I think it's hard to believe that anybody's going to be like, oh, we've found this vulnerability in this healthcare system, or we should keep it a big secret. Mm. I think most people would. I mean, there is, you know, there there are actually international rules that people have agreed to that mm -hmm. are longstanding that sort of speak to how we treat healthcare and that kind of thing in international conflict. And generally right. speaking, we're supposed to go healthcare is kind of not something we should mess with, right? That, that's just the sort of basic understanding that people have. Sure. So I yeah, think, well, and it's I think very different. Happening. You know, it's very different from other sanctions and agreements that we have because a cyber weapon today, that zero-day exploit, can be completely useless tomorrow, right? Whereas if you're yeah. developing nuclear weapons, like you have those nuclear weapons, right? Like <laughs> yeah. got a pretty long that's shelf. True. I mean, there is a shelf life, but it's much longer than a zero-day is... flown around. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, although, yes, that's true, but I think we would all say that um, that shelf life for um, vulnerabilities is probably longer than we want it to be, and I think that's getting yeah. better. Mm -hmm. But there are certain sectors where, you know, technology that gets deployed in those sectors is designed to last decades. It wasn't necessarily designed to be connected to the internet, um, and then somebody kind of helpfully applied an API and said, let's connect it to the internet. So now we can operate it on the internet or monitor it on the internet. Um, but those systems, you know, they're in place for a really, really, really long time. And, and you know, we all hear stories, I think, about organizations that, that have some core system that they spend a gajillion dollars on mm -hmm. and or a gajillion pounds on, um, and uh, they cannot risk that system and so they will put up with a whole bunch of other legacy systems around it in case not doing that results in the core system that they really care about freaking out and falling apart right right um so i think things do have a longer shelf life than we perhaps think they should i mean uh, as you know, an example I, i'm reading uh, a dick clark's ago, have you started reading dick clark's book uh what is, he was on the show a few weeks ago uh and book, I sorry? started reading the uh, fifth domain yeah, the fifth domain. Thank you. He was the cybersecurity advisor for uh, forty Clinton, third, Bush yeah, forty third through forty fifth presidents uh, yeah. in the U.S. And he actually mentions Jim Routh. And really, what you you know kind of glean from that, and many of us have seen Jim speak uh, and understand the program at Aetna, Um, And it's all about resilience, right? So, what, I mean, yeah. based on our conversation, we know there's going to be threats that 
we don't know about. Like that's always, that's a constant, right? And the only yeah. thing we can do is to be more resilient. And we make that sound easy, but it's really not, <laughs> right? No, it, I mean, it's not. And, and here's the thing is like, when you think about cybersecurity, everything that you're doing from scratch, from beginning to end, is always just about increasing resilience. Like yeah. there is no state of being secure. That's mm -hmm. just not a thing. Um, it is. It is always being less less exposed or less likely or less at risk right. in some way. Um, and so it's always how you build resilience, how you build your ability to bounce back, right? And and um, and I think there is an increasing maturity in understanding that, but it's still a really, really, really long way to go. I think there's still a lot of people who don't necessarily have that point of view or that understanding. And it's funny because, you know, obviously this, this show is designed more for the leadership side. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're talking to leadership, something that business leaders understand is business continuity. Yes, you know, that exactly. as a leader in an organization is your job is to think about how you mm -hmm. create continuity and growth for your organization. And so putting security into the context of continuity is actually something that's relatable to people. Mm -hmm. They just haven't necessarily done it on the topic of cybersecurity in the past. And I think for security leaders, if you can if you can bridge that way and make it about resilience and continuity, then you start speaking the same language as as the business leaders and you can make it relevant to them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Matt. I've been, I commandeered the the interview. No, that's fine. I mean, I, these were all the topics we were going to talk about, anyways, right? Um, but we all know that when it comes to cybercrime, there there are certain things we can and can't do to protect ourselves, right? If we right. can increase costs or complexity or hacking have back is, resilient systems. Hacking back is an interesting one about what you can and can't do, <laughs> right? I knew you were going to try and lead me into a hack back conversation. I think we actually talked about it last time. Probably. <laughs> you and I have talked about hacking. Well, because John Strand and I did, you know, obviously a bunch of research and, and created tools and techniques um, that John and I thought are look, there's lines, right? Like there's lines where you have to work with law enforcement and law enforcement needs to go get a warrant, right? We we're very clear on that. Mm -hmm. And there's other activities where it's not necessarily hacking back. It's more information gathering about your attackers and using that information for your own protection and sharing that also with law enforcement, right? Uh, yeah. But the so straight the hacking back is a, it's a sticky issue. Yeah. Well, I, here's the problem I have. Cause like I, I, I get put in the situation of arguing against this all the time and people make this, Oh, it's information gathering, uh, argument. And you know, we like information and security. We share information. We gather information. Information is good. Data feeds what we do. And I agree with all of that. That's great. The problem I have is if an attacker basically was running at me with a spear and it was a straight line, then I would be like, it is totally within my rights to, gather information, right. if you will, about, about what they're doing. I actually would even make an argument that it's within my rights to, you know, sidestep or, uh, or, or to, I don't know why, by the way, why my attacker is so old fashioned that they're using a spear, but this is what I went for. It seemed like a straight line comparison. <laughs> um, so if that's what they're doing, great. The problem is that's not often how cyber criminals work. Mm. And typically they're leveraging other assets that they've already compromised in some way to make an attack. So the problem I have with this whole gathering information thing is that effectively the information you're gathering isn't just about your cyber attacker. It's about all the assets that mm -hmm. they've leveraged, which means you're sort of also gathering information on people, on people who've been victimized. You're effectively mm -hmm. violating the privacy of people who've already been victimized. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not like the biggest privacy proponent that exists, but I'm just not sure that anyone has made a super compelling argument to me about why cybersecurity companies or cybersecurity professionals should have a right to violate the, the expectation of privacy of people who've already been victimized. It is different if you are operating on behalf of law enforcement under mm -hmm. a warrant. Right. That is different. Right. Um, yeah, and I think if you are going to do any level of information gathering, you have to take into account the privacy laws, like Jen stated. Yeah. Also, the laws on the books for hacking. You can't violate the CFAA <laughs> if you're nope, hacking or back. Or the CMA in the UK. The, the, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. You need to you need to know what those laws say, mm -hmm. and and you know at the end of the day, um, good intentions will 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 certainly get you a, a fair hearing. And but they certainly, won't, we've they seen won't... that in in the history of hacking, several times over. Yeah, I I think like you know you, uh, I think there's an increased level of sophistication and and uh, and understanding and compassion, honestly 
from law enforcement, particularly when I look at the computer crime and intellectual property section of the Department of Justice, which actually in the past uh, six, seven years has made a lot of effort to reach out to the security community, get to know the security community, participate mm -hmm. with the security community, has come out to a lot of events, spoken at a lot of events, um, has welcomed and and uh, invited feedback from the community. And, and last year, last year, the year before, 2018, um, they actually uh, sent a letter to the Librarian of Congress as part of the whole DMCA um, exemption reauth mm -hmm. around uh, security research. They sent a letter, DOJ, this is a big deal, sent a letter saying security research is super important and we should support it. Uh, and that was a, a sort of like a, you know, that was a, 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 a big moment, I think, in terms of, um, you know, making like it's hard for an agency like the Department of Justice to make public statements mm -hmm. in support of a group. Right. And right. so for them to do that, to come out with something like that is a big deal. And I think it does show how their position has shifted and how they do have a lot more appreciation for what security is trying to do and what security professionals are trying to do and the role that they play and this tension that exists in the law. Because the problem is you don't you you recognize the security research can actually advance protection for everybody or, or, or reduce exposure for everybody. So it, it's important to advance security. But you don't want to create a carve out in the law that also creates a backdoor because we like talking about backdoors in security mm -hmm. um, for attackers. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make it so that you've basically put in a clause that attackers can take advantage of. And with hackback, it also becomes difficult because then you've got that gray line where it's like, OK, you're a security professional and you were doing security things. But like what oversight exists? Like, how do you manage right. that oversight? What does that oversight look like? And I don't know of a single government agency that is sitting there being like, oh, oh, pick me. I want to manage this. I want right, to create right. a framework. I want to have to, to to certify organizations to do this stuff. Like nobody, nobody wants to do that job. And there's a huge Just legal NIST. liability question that exists. Only NIST wants to do that job. Because well, they get mandated to do it. But I also okay. think that it's interesting. One no, of the things, even they don't want it, even with the mandate. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things that I think has changed in the past twenty years with respect to vulnerability disclosure is that legitimate security researchers have much better outlets, right, across oh, yeah. the board. I mean, we've got yep. tons of CTF challenges. We're talking to Ed Scotus. We're like twenty plus years. Like there was the DefCon CTF. There wasn't much else. Now you can take your pick from a, over a hundred, right? right? Um, we've got bug bounty programs where you can responsibly yep. disclose. I think the U.S. certs are much taking a much more prominent role uh, than twenty years ago, which I think all of that has helped responsible disclosure, right? I, I think uh, I think there's a lot of things. So I think the the DMCA exemption, which I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. When that came into effect, it created a big sea change. Um, I remember after the um, so the way that it worked was, excuse me, in um, in 2015 when the Librarian of Congress came out and said we're going to make an exemption for um, good faith security research testing that's done in a um, in a non production environment. Mm -hmm. um, they said. We're going to wait a year. We think it's going to have an impact, so we're going to wait a year before this piece comes into effect. And there were some there were some qualifiers and addendums that I'm not going to go into, but but that was basically the gist of what it said. And I sat in rooms during that year with people from all sorts of um, industries that had not previously really considered themselves technology manufacturers, not in the way that we think of them, and they hadn't considered themselves certainly to be software companies. Um, so automotive, medical mm -hmm. device, like all. So that critical infrastructure, right? Um, none of them had ever really been receptive in the past to security research, in independent security research, I should say. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they recognized that they were going to have to be, that the law was no longer going to enable them to say, no, back beast. And so they would have to actually recognize that they were going to get inundated. And during that year, we saw a huge number of them roll out vulnerability intake processes and mm -hmm. start to explore bug bounties and that kind of stuff. And it did happen in a very similar time frame as some other like sort of high level things that got a lot of attention, like mm -hmm. the G pack and that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, but it created a real sea change in in attitude. Um, 
And now there's a lot more support for independent security research and a lot more understanding of it. And you see things like, um, you know, Boeing's created a, um, a cybersecurity advisory council mm-hmm. to ask the community to sort of, you know, partner with them. And and um, and and you've seen people roll out, as you say, bug bounties. And you've seen things like um, hack the Pentagon and ha- hack the SAT right. is one that's, now, that's does, happening. Jen, right does now. this extend into enterprises? In that, if I've acquired some technology, the enterprise, the company can test it and discover uh, vulnerabilities in it. Like uh, my pen test friends, right? They come in, they test a bunch of stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, we found a zero day in that product that you had, right? And that's yeah. still a tricky issue, be- especially with the pen tester, because now you've got what the pen tester thinks of disclosure, what the company thinks of disclosure, yep. and what the vendor thinks of disclosure. Yeah, and it is, we've definitely had situations where, you know, one of our pen testers has discovered something on engagement and the client has said, we don't want you to disclose. And we're like, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. Why would you think that way? Mm-hmm. Like, this is exposing you to risk. Yes. <laughs> and their point of view is, well, if you disclose it, it's going to expose me to a lot more risk. And we're like, yeah, no, 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 this is how you get a patch. Right, right. <laughs> um, so uh, it is difficult. And, and we've also had stories of... Um, researchers that have come to us who mm-hmm. said i've discovered something because bear in mind a researcher doesn't have to be somebody who's paid to do security research right. or who it's their job right often researchers or discoverers discover incidentally or accidentally so they right. could be sys admins or network admins and it's part of their job yeah, my so many people have come to me right that, they've acquired technology whether it's at their work or at right. home like hey i acquired this device exactly. and I was, and I was like it my, wasn't even like trying to test but i was working with it and then i started debugging it and then i was looking my at favorite and, yeah, is right? do you remember the five-year-old boy who discovered a vulnerability in Microsoft Xbox because his dad had locked him out with parental controls and he just wanted to play. So he figured out how to get in. Uh, no, I, hadn't I just heard think that's that awesome, right? Yeah, that's and his my dad kids. was savvy enough to say we should disclose this to Microsoft. Right. And Microsoft paid out on it. They they gave a bounty on it, which is awesome. Which is amazing because um, we so, don't see too many vulnerabilities on the Xbox platform because it was very no, well designed from the start. Speaking of you mentioned something security by design, that is a shining example. Right. And so and so I think um I think that we have seen uh, a lot of advancement on this, but we've had we've had people who've come to us who are in that bucket of they're a sysadmin of some some kind, and they come to us and they said I've discovered this this bug in the system that we use at work, and work won't let me disclose. Yes. And will will you do it for like I've been told that you're willing to disclose for people when they're mm-hmm. in this situation? Will you do it? And we've said yeah, absolutely. And you know it is difficult because. These days, we get a lot less. We get a lot less legal threats, which is great. Um, but you still need legal we counsel. Also get a lot of- right? Sorry. You still need legal counsel if you're in possession of a zero day vulnerability, and you're an independent person. I, I it is. I people come to me uh, occasionally too, and I'm like, if if you don't have legal counsel or you don't have the means to acquire or someone that's going to help you, uh, you're better off, I think, doing what Jen is suggesting and taking it to someone like a Rapid Seven that does have legal counsel. So what counsel. I would say is, it depends. If you discover something, at, it, so your first stop is to look at what their website says. Mm-hmm. Do they have a way of receiving? Do they have any language on there on expectations? And more and more organizations are having that. If they don't have any of that, then you are correct. Like you are probably in for a bumpy ride. Yep. Um, at best, you might get ignored. Mm. Um, we, we get ignored still a lot more sure. than we would like to. You know, Cert once made a joke that um, they send their disclosures by recorded mail so that they at least know that somebody received it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and sometimes we feel like we should try the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we get ignored a lot less now and and we do see more sort of goodwill it hasn't completely changed though for sure um and it is still a a slippery slope but as you say i think you can see some of the certs trying to take a a a stronger role and thinking Mm -hmm. about how they evolve that culture so for example um cert cc just uh soft launched um a new platform called vince don't ask what it stands for Mm. um vulnerability intake i'm going to say as part of it mm-hmm. um and and the platform is for for managing the coordination of vulnerability disclosures right um and they made a very intentional decision that they would have it such that um the discloser and the vendor would be expected to participate in the space together 
And to begin with, I think they got some pushback from some of the vendors about that, mm -hmm. saying, you know, we're not we're not super excited about this because we feel like the disclosure is going to be privy to private conversations, and we just don't have high trust. And I think. I think that trust doesn't exist on both sides often, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding. We've had lots of situations where we've just tried to broker that initial relationship, and once we've created that baseline of trust mm -hmm. and sort of established good intent on both sides, but also right. expectations for behavior. Yes. And we've said to people, like, this is how you need to proceed. Right. Please don't kind of sue this security this researcher. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but like, it's on both sides, right? Because, yeah. you know, researchers can also have a bit of a habit of being like, sure. well, this is nonsense and I'm just going to go on Twitter. Yep. And, 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 or, or, you know, how many emails have we got in recent years that have said, how much is this worth? Yeah. And you're like, okay, be careful not to sound like you're trying to extort us because that's a thing that you do to other people and they're not going to be as nice about it as we are. Right. I mean, it goes back uh, to our you know, uh, initial conversation about uh, vulnerabilities and zero days and exploits and who you, you would sell them to. Do you sell them to another nation state? Do you sell them to the U.S.? Once it's gone, you don't know how that government agency is going to use it. You just have to have some trust, right? I mean, Charlie Miller yeah. certainly ran, you know, ran into that situation and has been a big proponent of you know, if you're going to sell it, sell it to a, as trustworthy a government as you can yeah. and hope they use right. it responsibly. Well, I think, I mean, everybody writes their own code of ethics on that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And they make their own decisions on it and you have to live with what you decide to do. Right. Um, I would say, yes, look for a country that has more oversight and more transparency on how they handle these things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all you really care about is the money, 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 money. In yeah, which case, yeah, exactly. you do you, boo. But right, right. <laughs> um, uh, I, would, I would urge you to think about the repercussions of that. Right. But good <laughs> advice for enterprises as well. You know, certainly that stuff's going to bubble up to many of the uh, our audience in the CISO level uh, about what you do when you uh, find something and need to disclose it. So. I think, I mean, one of the things I would say also for CISOs who are looking at vulnerability um, inbounds and researcher um, outreach and that kind of stuff is um, I Am The Cavalry has this really nice slide on the five P's of, um, of researcher motivations. And I think generally most people who don't spend a lot of time on this kind of come up with two, right? They either think it's sort of profit driven um, or they think it's um, prestige driven, right? That people are just trying to get them for themselves or or get free. Well, I was going to say popularity, but okay. <laughs> Popul I think popularity falls under that prestige right. bucket gotcha. as well. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely know people who that's what they've cited is like, I just want to be, I just want to be able to go and do a talk at a conference and, and hang out with my mates, right? Right, yeah. Um, and so I think, um, I think that it's easy when you're feeling defensive and you're feeling like you're on the back foot and you, those are the only two motivations that you understand to get some like very dismissive about researchers and why they're trying to do it. The reality for me, like, yes, okay, most researchers that I work with um, are paid to do research because they work for a security company. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the researchers that I work with both within Rapid7 and externally um, and and particularly people like these sister admins who come to us and ask for help, what motivates them is actually trying to do the right thing. They're yep. protectors. Mm -hmm. That's the P that's strong for them is mm -hmm. they want to actually make the world a safer place. Mm -hmm. And um, they're actually trying to trying to help protect society, basically. Right. Um, so I think I think really kind of looking further into what the motivations are. Um, firstly, it is good to know who you're dealing with. And it's actually the number one step in any negotiation is understand the motivations of your of your negotiation opponent right Agreed. um otherwise you're never going to find common ground mm -hmm. and so i think it helps to like get past that that sort of difficult period at the beginning where you're dealing with all the distrust fantastic sorry man i know we went a few minutes over but that's it's fine no just Jen, an engaging thank conversation you. <laughs> yeah thank you so much for joining us on business security Big weekly blow. paul had a blast <laughs> <laughs> Um, Matt, it was lovely meeting you, though. <laughs> um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm a I'm a giant blabbermouth, but um, thank you very much for having me on. Um, it was it was a delight. Um, and can I also just add that as somebody who started to host a uh, very amateurish um, podcast in 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 recent months, that uh, there's nothing like being on a really professional one to make you realize just how much of an amateur you really are. Oh, thank um, you, so Jen. thank you, oh. thank you for letting me come on and see how the professionals do it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. Us.
And to learn more about Rapid7, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Rapid7. With that, we'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 